When you came out to Hungary, what did you think the Communist Party was doing right here? Just about everything. I was a communist from Britain. They seemed to be doing all the things that we uh, worked for in Britain. Dignity of the workers. The workers had a dignity they never had before. Living standards were high, comparatively. The uh, pensions were the sort of thing we could dream about in Britain in those days, that they would be related to your uh, actual salary. So on the whole, they seemed to do everything right, so much so that when any Hungarian was slightly critical, I immediately educated them about how fortunate they were uh, to be living in a socialist society. After a little while, did you see that some things weren't right? What were they? Well, the first thing one saw that wasn't right was the fact that people did not speak openly, did not say uh, all that they felt about many things, that in the countryside the peasants by no means were happy about the compulsory delivery system, and that inside the party there was virtually no real democracy. And, well, what else can you say? Uh, they saw, there were so many things which added up to not, as I once said, a police state, but very much a state in which workers certainly had very little say. Do you think that was a result of the sort of Soviet influence or not? I think it was a result of the Soviet influence in the sense that we communists all thought that we were going the right way. And well, it's the influence of Stalin, yes, uh, and of Stalin's approach to the whole question of building socialism, which we all uh, immediately followed. I, I had the, exam the idea, there's the class enemy, you've got to fight him, this is the way to do it, it succeeds in the Soviet Union, so you do it here as well. Can you give me an example of this problem at the time? A personal example. Well, in the first period when I was here, I was invited to Sega to speak to the university students there. And I had a very interesting young fellow interpreting for me, and he and I had lots of discussions about world problems and so on. In the course of which he said that he thought Yugoslavia had a better brand of socialism than Hungary. I dissuaded him. Uh, when I came back to Budapest in the Federation, they asked me, how did you get on? I said it was a very good, wonderful trip, and uh, the deputy and I had some very interesting discussions. He said, "What about?" I said, "Well, he thought Yugoslav socialism was better than the Hungarian variety." I didn't think any more about it. But two years later, a young woman in the federation asked me, "Do you know Istvan Kovac?" And I said, "No, I don't think." She said, "The name should mean something to you." I said, Why? She says, "Because on the basis of the report you made." about his preference for Yugoslav socialism, he was uh, taken into custody, and probably that and other things, he was sentenced to uh, two years in prison. Did that shake your faith in communism? Oh, no. But uh, I had also had my own personal trial in between. The, the leadership of the Federation wanted to send me back to Britain as a saboteur for, uh, because of political differences. And the two Hungarians in the committee who knew the truth didn't speak at all. And afterwards, when I said to them, why the hell didn't you open your mouth? They said, well, uh, uh, <laughs> we were afraid to because the Soviet government was on the other side. And so I'd had plenty of experience of it, uh, of these things as I went along. No, I didn't change my uh, uh, faith in communism, if you could call it faith. It didn't change my belief in socialism as a superior or a potentially superior system of society. You were here during the events of 56. How do you interpret them? Well, it was a counter-revolution. It was a mass movement of, uh, of people, of young people, writers and workers, but mainly young people, uh, for change inside the Communist Party, change in leadership, uh, a Hungarian, a specific Hungarian uh, form of socialism, and, but that was subverted in the course of the demonstrations and events into, into a process which was day after day after day was going hell-bent back to uh, the semi-fascist Hungary of uh, pre-war years. There was no way in which it was going to stop suddenly and become a nice democratic uh, British capitalism or something like that. This, that was the reality of the situation, and that's why I took my stand on against it.
What sort of things did you see during the events of '56 that convinced you that, for example, there were there were fascists, there were criminals in the? the well, for example, on the on the 28th or 29th of October, when the party and government uh, and agreed on a ceasefire, and the opposition leadership agreed on a ceasefire, uh, I went out to have a look at what was going on, and the thing I see is people making their way towards Republic Square where the party headquarters are. Everybody was supposed to have handed in their arms. They were going to Republic Square to attack the party headquarters. Uh, later they were joined by tanks and the fighting went on all day and at the end of the day they brought the uh, uh, people out who were, you call them defenders, young soldiers in fact, and, uh, and some leading communists hung them from trees upside down, cut out their heart, dragged them through the streets, uh, shot the five young people in uniform that they brought out, who came out with their hands up to surrender, shot them. Uh, and from that, you, in that, you could feel that this now events were totally out of control of Imre Naj and the supposed opposition leadership. I also had the experience of going, for example, to Parliament to negotiate about the houses that belong to the World Federation of Democratic Youth, which Hungarians were moving into and ejecting the foreigners. So I went to, with two other people to see Imre Nodge, the Prime Minister, uh, to ask him if they couldn't do something, uh, give a diplomatic immunity or something. We had to wait three hours because he was changing his government once again. We never got to see him because it took too long. But the officer in charge of the bodyguard at Parliament gave me a leaflet on my way out, which was from the National Revolutionary Council of the Armed Forces, saying, Imre Nodge and such Bolsheviks, we have to get out. Uh, and continue, the, uh, in other words, the very head of the bodyguard of the, uh, of the uh, Prime Minister was giving out leaflets saying he had to be ejected. I was also at a meeting where they founded the, or refounded the Christian, uh, the equivalent of the Christian Democratic Party. So about a hundred people in the cinema, they elected a leadership, and then eight young men armed to the teeth came in, tucked everyone off the platform and appointed a new leadership. Well, I could give you many examples of this. I also had the experience of a machine gun stuck in my stomach uh, and uh, trying to make up their minds whether I was, should be shot out of hand as a communist from Britain or welcomed as a <laughs> as a advanced guard of the United Nations uh, in um, force coming to help the Hungarian Revolution. Did you did those, that period also show a lot of communists were opportunists? I believe there was some young woman you were helping get into the party changed her view. Yes, well. Well, she was a party member. Uh, she had just become a party member on the eve of the counter-revolution, but in the uh, party unit in the World Federation of Democratic Youth, they had had arguments for nearly a year about her application for membership. Uh, it was opposed on the grounds of her social origin. In other words, she had come from a middle-class or upper-class family. But finally, just on the eve of the counter-revolution, they accepted her, and she became a member of the party. And I met her on the second day of the counter-revolution, October the 25th, here in Napecoster, Shagutsa. And uh, she flings her arms open and says, Charlie, I always knew there was a good God above who would come down and get rid of all these communists. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, of course, there were many opportunists in the party. Most parties have opportunists, of course. But that was a peculiarly favorable situation for opportunists, naturally. Did you think it was right to punish a lot of the people? A lot of people were executed after the 56 events, including Imran Naj. What was your view of that at the time? At the time of the execution of Imran Naj, I was against it. I think I'm still against it, in the sense that uh, I think it was... Uh, well, I'm against capital punishment to begin with, and therefore I wouldn't have executed Naj in any case. I think it was a mistake in the sense that Imran Naj was not a conscious... Uh, traitor to socialism or to Hungarian socialism, but a man who found himself trapped by his own opportunism and ego into a situation where he was completely in the hands of the right, of counter-revolution. 
and didn't have the either the courage or the ability to break out of it. That was how I felt at the time. And so I was against, when I heard he had been executed, I was against. Of course, I've since seen some of Imre Nagy's uh, memoirs, which have been published in the West, in which it becomes clear that a year before these events, in actual fact, he was uh, uh, proposing a policy of taking Hungary out of the Warsaw Pact and of uh, various such steps, which in the circumstances, in my opinion, are very close to treachery. To say that you take Hungary out of the Warsaw Pact at that time, at the height of the Cold War, and put it in, because it wouldn't go anywhere else, but into the camp uh, of the United States and the West, yes, that was treachery. And uh, so I understand the execution, but no, I don't think it was uh, uh, correct. And I think that it was politically a mistake because you can still find in Hungary the feeling that, well, Imre Nodge was done to death unfairly and, uh, and that maybe it wasn't because the Hungarians decided but the Soviet Union decided and so on, all of which I think is nonsense. But there is, yes, that does give some grounds for the, or some basis for the idea of Imre Nodge as a martyr. Would you describe the events in Czechoslovakia in 68 and the Solidarity Crisis, would you also see those as being um, counter-revolutions in some sense? Yes, I think Czechoslovakia was hungry in slow motion. It would have ended in much the same way. And in an, an even more critical situation, because Czechoslovakia was bound for the arms of West Germany. Uh, a we a Czechoslovakia which left the Warsaw Pact and left the socialist camp would inevitably have fallen into the hands of West Germany. And therefore all the other things that followed, like the opening to the East, the West German Ostpolitik, the Soviet settlement of relations between East and West, the, you know, the West Germany and the Soviet Union, and even the United States and the Soviet Union agreement on salt, and all of these would have gone by the board because the impetus would have been for the West to say, aha, now we have Czechoslovakia, it's the next step, we must take the next steps. Some communists in Hungary now talk of having a pluralism, some sort of pluralism, but, but do you think, do, do the communist leaders in Hungary you know, would still subscribe to the view that at least there are two things the Communist Party can never do. It can never leave, lose its leading role in society and can never lose its close relationship with the Soviet Union? Well, I'll answer the first one first, the uh, second one first. I can imagine socialism in the Soviet Union without Hungary, but I cannot imagine socialism in Hungary without the Soviet Union, or anywhere else in the world, without the existence of a so Soviet Union and what it means and what help it can give. Um, the leading role of the party, yes, I think that's absolutely essential. Um, I, I would put it another way, in 1956, um, I became more convinced than ever before of the need for the leading role of a communist party. When I saw a communist party fall apart and disintegrate and the political vacuum that was created for the working class, simply one of not knowing where to turn, where to go, or what to do next. Yes, in a socialist society, I think leading role, but I think the Hungarian Socialist Workers' Party, now in the way in which it's exploring uh, the representation of group interests, the possibility of uh, the Patriotic People's Front and other social organizations taking a much bigger role in deciding policy uh, are all leading to a form of pluralism within socialism. You see, last week when Magyar Nemzet, the paper of the Patriotic People's Front, in a signed editorial said that members of parliament were saying in committees that unless there were changes in the leadership, when the parliamentary debate came on the budget, they were going to propose that the budget should not be discussed at all, never mind voted on. And these expressions of opinions of, uh, of a very open and frank kind, uh, which represent not just communists, but uh, the general feeling within the country, I think, yes, that we are on, we're on the road to what I would call socialist pluralism, with the Communist Party playing a leading role.